everyone. My name is Robin Elander with the Downtown Santa Barbara Organization, Executive Director here, and I'm so excited to be on our next Downtown Business Spotlight. Um, we have two amazing uh, business owners here today, uh, Sean Smith from Institution Ale and Doug Marjoram from Marjoram Wine Company. So excited, award-winning uh, organizations and uh, Matt Katman from The Independent is our host today, and he is the senior editor at the Santa Barbara Independent, uh, where he's worked from since 99 and covered a wide range of topics. Um, today, he's focusing mostly on food and drink. He said that he's actually been on a number of calls today tasting wine, so having lots of fun um, interviewing local um, contributors. Uh, he is the contributing editor for Wine Enthusiast Magazine, where he reviews over 200 wines every month. And his first book um, called Vines and Vision, Winemakers of Santa Barbara County, comes out this fall. So super excited to get started. Um, welcome, gentlemen. And Matt, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Robin, uh, for the nice introduction. I actually, the book is, the first six copies of the book showed up. Some of it, two of them are behind my head right now. Um, so then the, the rest of the few thousand copies show up uh, in about a, about, about a month. Well, just before Thanksgiving is what they're telling us. So um, there'll be a lot of those copies out there to find uh, when that time comes. But yes, I have been in Santa Barbara for quite a while covering the food and drink scene. Uh, I've known Doug for many, many years, uh, both through his role at the wine cast, which he was a owner of for, for many years. Um, and also uh, as now as a winemaker, especially through through my other job at, at Wine Enthusiast as well. Um, Institution Ale uh, on, on State Street has been um, making beer in Camarillo since I think 2013. Uh, and then, and I believe it was February of 2019, they came up to Santa Barbara and opened, opened right on State Street, you know, put their, put their money on uh, betting on downtown Santa Barbara. Um, and both of these companies have been uh, having to be creative uh, during COVID, during the pandemic. And... Um, you know, pivoting, as everyone's saying now, to, to kind of serve their customers. Uh, and I think both are doing that quite well uh, right now. And, you know, when I came down State Street, right when it first opened, um, I ended up having dinner at uh, Holdren's um, that night. It was like, I think it was like the first or second night when things were actually back to open and everyone had spread onto the street. Institution Ale had a great spread right away. Uh, and, but everything was, it, seemed, it, was, it was very busy, but also I think really spread out. And so I think um, if they're keeping up that, that flow, that safety, and people are having a, managing to have a good time during these really weird times. So um, we're going to talk to Sean about that. Um, but let's first start with Doug. Doug's been in town for uh, quite a while now, um, and I got into the restaurant business back in the, the early 80s with Winecast. So Doug, tell us, uh, tell us about your career and tell us about you know, how you've, had, you've been on the front lines of downtown Santa Barbara for a few decades now. So how is this all well, four decades at least now. So how has how this all changed and, and uh, how'd you get where you are today? Well, yeah, when you, when you said, hey, you know, why don't you explain your, your, your many decades of being in downtown Santa Barbara? I was like, yikes, it can't be that long. Uh, but it has been a, a long run, uh, first with wine cask and now with uh, a margarine wine company. Uh, and obviously, you know, uh, downtown is, uh, I used to play this game called Sim City where you'd build little towns and then you'd see how it succeeded and things went up and down. And, I and love that's, that game. What, what, it's a great, it's a video I love game. That game. Yeah, 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 it's a great it. game. Yeah. And uh, in, in downtown Santa Barbara has been that way. The epicenter has moved many times in my, uh, uh, in my time in, in Santa Barbara and, uh, and it's moving again. It's uh, obviously with, uh, with State Street being uh, revitalized with the closure uh, it's been one of the great things that's happened down, downtown Santa Barbara. Obviously, uh, Marjoram Tasting Room is down in the funk zone. Uh, our tasting room was in El Paseo for, for many, many years. I was in the DO, uh, the Downtown Organization Board, for about six years in the 80s. Uh, and then I was recently on the board for about uh, three years. I didn't, I, I didn't take another term. I, I traded out my brother. Uh, uh, who's now on the DO board, who represents the Presidio neighborhood. And um, I, two, two interesting things happened on, with, with me getting back on the DO board. I, after, I mean, it must've been almost 30 years, I went back on the board and I, I saw some people, I said, oh, you're, you're back on the board too, that's amazing. And they were like, no, 
we've actually never left. <laughs> so, uh, I, my, my, and then the second thing I, I, so my two things when they went around and said, what do you think should happen? I said, there should be term limits. And then everyone looked at me like I should be um, murdered because it's a really great breakfast and no one wants to get off that fun board. And the second thing I said is we should close State Street. Uh, this was now four years ago and we should close State Street and emulate other cities that have been successful downtown. And everyone went, no, we can't possibly do that. That's not gonna happen. Now with the COVID, obviously uh, it's happened and it's proven to be a tremendous success. And, and uh, it's, it's terrible that, that it happened this way, but uh, I've been wanting State Street to close for the last 40 years. And uh, it's, it's, I think really is gonna revitalize that, that part of town. Obviously we're in the funk zone. It's extremely uh, a high traffic area. We're right across the street from the Hotel California. We, uh, we reconned the area to decide where we wanted. Our lease was running out in El Paseo uh, and we were just sort of looking around where to go and, and we chose the space that was available at the Hotel California. So we can additionally have not only our tasting room but have a kitchen and serve some food along with the wine because uh, food, I make wines that are very food oriented and, and my wines taste better when they're shared with, with, uh, with, with food. So yeah, it's been, um, it's been an interesting uh, amount of time and I, I, I love seeing the shifts. I love seeing the revitalization. And, uh, but I think, I think it can be prosperous from the bankruptcy court to the, to the sea. And uh, that's what I'm seeing now. I think maybe this is the best time for downtown with all these great little areas that are all being prosperous versus a prosperous area than a dead zone of State Street and then a prosperous area than a dead zone. And so uh, I applaud the DO, they're doing a great job. Uh, I, I, the city, you know, I will leave all my comments about the city uh, to private conversations if anyone wants to contact me directly and tell what, what a horrible pain it was to work with the city to build my tasting room, which should have been easy. Uh, uh, the city is just, just was was an impediment versus a, a helping, and we were on the we were on the fast track. There was an expedited system to get permits to build uh, on State Street or within one block of State Street, and they did nothing to expedite my uh, my uh, opening my taste room in Santa Barbara. Cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars extra for, because of their incompetence. Uh, so I'll I'll leave it at, at that. Um, but we're open. Your, yeah, how'd you go? T tell us about how, just biographically, how you went from being a restaurateur to being uh, really focused on becoming a winemaker and, and leaving the restaurant world. So I, um, when I graduated from UCSB, go Gauchos, I uh, and my family, we opened a very small restaurant next to an existing wine store, which was called the Wine Cast. And this was in 1981. I was 12 years old. Uh, I graduated <laughs> early from college. Um, the, uh, the, the restaurant uh, thrived uh, and we started focusing, since it was called the wine cast, it was right when some of the first winemakers came to, uh, to Santa Barbara County. There was Jim Clendenin and uh, Bob Lindquist and Adam Tolmack, and we all became great friends. Uh, we started making wine together. I was operating the restaurant and making wine with these guys. And then after you know, a, a long period of time, I had bought my family out of the restaurant. The restaurant had grown quite to be quite the operation. We had numerous restaurants and a catering business and wine stores. Uh, then in 2007, I decided to uh, sell the business and focus 100% on my winery that I had started by myself in 2001 after being bought out of my winery I was running with J Jim and Bob from a Bon Climat Coupe in 1998. I sort of went forward and went backward. Um, but uh, you, you just, you know, restaurants are tough business uh, and my passion was wine and it just seemed like a good idea to, uh, for, for, my, for our legacy business to, to concentrate on making wine uh, and, and sell the restaurant. So that's what we did. And you also decided to focus, to, to relate this to downtown Santa Barbara even more, you decided to focus your tasting room efforts um, even before, when, when you had the first one in El Paseo, those were in downtown Santa Barbara rather than doing them at your winery, near your winery in Buellton. And why'd you make that decision? Well, I live in Santa Barbara. Uh, at that time I was involved with the Winecast as a consultant. Uh, and so there was enough space at the Winecast restaurant to open a tasting room within their confines. Uh, and so it made a lot of sense, uh, but, I, I, but I really wanted to get back into, into food. So that's why the transition from going from El Paseo down to, um, down to uh, Hotel California. 
Right. And so now your tasting really kind of combines your love of food with your love of wine. Uh, yeah, we, we actually had two, we actually have two brands and we left Barden up in El Paseo, but that lease was running out. So during the COVID, we were looking for a space to move Barden to its own space, but we decided actually, since we were closed to remodel the just recently opened tasting room uh, to accommodate Barden. And so now both Marjoram and Barden are at the same tasting room. We do, do two different flights uh, and you can taste two different sets of wine. Uh, Marjoram all, is all San Inez Valley, primarily a lot from our own estate. And then Barden are wines just from Santa Rita Hills, just the cold climate to the, to the west of, of Buellton. Uh, so are you fully out of El Paseo now? Yeah, yeah, we are just yeah, have okay. the one, one space. Uh, the, the winery is closed. And I think, you know, the winery is closed to the public for many, for the, for the beginning of time. We were doing tastings there on the weekend, but for COVID we're closed. I think we're going to keep it closed except for, for by appointment. So we can do really high touch tours of the winery in the barrel room and have it be an experience. Uh, and we'll just leave the winery open by appointment only. And then uh, have the Barden and Marjoram Tasting Room at, at Hotel California be the main place where we taste and, and see, see customers and, and restaurant customers and retailers Great. and the like. So we're going to come back to you to hear what you did uh, to, to be safe and open during COVID. But let's, let's go to Sean Smith from Institution Ale first. And, and Sean, tell us a little bit about your, your family story and, and how you guys started making beer back in 2013 or whenever that was. And then uh, we can talk about why you moved uh, to sort of move up not move, but open day tasting or a uh, brew pub essentially on State Street. So tell us, tell us your story. Yeah. Um, so Institution's a, a family owned and operated business um, with myself, my older brother, Ryan, and my uh, dad, Roger. Um, and we got into home brewing. Uh, when my brother and I were in college, we went to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and our last couple of years there really got into home brewing and took that hobby back with us when we moved back to our hometown of Camarillo after college and kind of got our dad involved then at the time and um, kind of just got in the hobby with us. And it was just a, a hobby that spiraled out of control. I guess you can say it was, you know, a small little, you know, once a month thing when we first started to the point where we were, you know, brewing two or three times a week and it was taking up so much space that uh, my dad's house. He, uh, he has a construction background, so he had kind of this spare warehouse in Camarillo that he'd keep a lot of his construction supplies, and our, our home brewing uh, equipment had kind of, like I said, spiraled out of control, so we ended up just putting all of it in his shop, and then kind of the light bulb went off when we were checking out a couple local breweries one night where we were like, hey, you know, this is, you know, what's the permitting process like? How could we actually sell this? Because, you know, we're we're making so much beer to experiment, but it's not even possible for us to make or drink all the beer we're making. You know, it's you're making 20 gallon batches and having two pints and then trying to brew it again. So uh, it kind of was just one of these. How many, how many years, what was that, that, that period between coming home from college and then actually launching a, a commercial brewery? Yeah, it was probably about five years or so, four or five years. So from probably 2009, to 2013, um, we were home brewing, um, and it had just grown gradually to the point where, you know, a we we thought our beer was on par with a lot of commercial breweries and microbreweries that we had had tasted, and then we kind of just fell into that opportunity of um, having that warehouse space, which was originally just for us to, you know, do our home brew, and then we looked into the permitting process, and Camarillo had never had a microbrewery in their city before, so we just started talking with people at local government and with landlords and kind of anybody who would be involved in zoning and just seeing like, Hey, you know, we're making a bunch of beer. If we wanted to, you know, get this all set up federally and statewide with our ABC and TTB license, you know, we'd be able to open a small little tap room and sure enough, it all was able to work out. So in 2013, it was just a little like 1500 square foot warehouse with, um, you know, pool and, uh, construction supplies in the back and then kind of a little partition where it was all the kind of what they call nano brewing or kind of glorified homebrew setup in the in the back and then just this little front which would be in a typical like 1500 square foot warehouse shop you have your little like showroom or two office set up we knocked out a couple walls and put in a little six foot bar and it was just this little you know 20 person you know, tasting room, no food, you know, really not even room to kind of sit down. You kind of just kind of fill your growler and go type of setup. And it was um, like a, a kind of a warehouse part of Camarillo too? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it was just in uh, 
yeah, it was over by the agricultural fields, um, kind of by the airport in Camarillo. Um, no foot traffic, no other businesses that were retail or you know, customer facing. So we were the only ones out there. And it was just kind of word of mouth for people to find out about it. And it was uh, for a lot of the locals, just kind of like the little hidden gym to stop in after work and get some beer to take home type of setup. Um, and what's the name referred to institution? Uh, we we're the old brewery, which is one I'm talking about was right next to Cal state channel islands where the old, uh, Camarillo state hospital was. Um, right. so our name tied off of that. And then, uh, yeah, we did that for a couple of years and it kind of slowly, slowly grew to the point where, you know, we were buying more tanks and there was a few restaurants in town that wanted to pick us up and we hadn't really planned for that. So we had to kind of up production here and there, wherever we could. And then we reached a tipping point in about 2015 where we couldn't really make any more beer at that spot. We were all kind of one foot in, we all had other jobs and everything. And then we decided to all, you know, quit our other jobs uh, invest in the brewery, get a small business loan, find a spot that would be a little bit bigger for production and all that. And so, um, yeah, we decided just to jump all in and, uh, we've been at a larger spot in Camarillo for probably three or four years now. And then of course the state street spot is, you know, year and a half strong now. So. And does your place in, uh, in Camarillo have food? It does. Yeah. So the concept's pretty similar to the one in Santa Barbara where it's, pizza, soft pretzels and beer, um, you know, layouts different and everything. Um, in our Camarillo location, um, where we manufacture the beer, we're in a manufacturing zone. Um, so it's not like a downtown vibe, like it is on our state street spot. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's got some freeway visibility, but it is in a manufacturing zone. So you do kind of have to pick it out. You're not just going to kind of come across it. Um, and we have our big production facility tied into the tasting room, which is kind of cool. Cause when you sit down and have a beer at the Camarillo spot you're surrounded by all the stainless steel and the canning line running and kind of all that cool stuff to see so it's a pretty good spot and was Santa Barbara your was your second spot that was your that was your your growth basically was Santa Barbara right yeah exactly we uh after we had opened um the Camarillo spot um we kind of always had a plan to open a satellite tap room and we just kind of searched up and down the the central coast I knew slow really well um because me and my brother went there um and we were just kind of checking anywhere in between we wanted it to be somewhere close where we can drive up there and you know be up there three or four times a week we didn't want to have something that was really inconvenient um and yeah the search kind of just started you know anywhere and everywhere on the central coast and specifically to santa barbara we were you know checking more industrial spots if we wanted to also brew a little bit there and have kind of a second production facility for experimental beers or you know barrel aging or whatever so we checked out that and of course we checked out the funk zone and a few other spots and then um we just kind of fell in love with that state street spot um you know rent was good at the time it was kind of when state street was really kind of searching for tenants and there was a lot of vacancies and um it just were, you know was you something we thought had all, a lot of potential were you scared at all about that period about the the, the vacancy and we haven't really fully emerged from that yet but the, obviously the, right. the issues now are a little different but um were you, was that something that scared you guys as business people when it came or you thought it was an opportunity i think a little of both um we definitely thought it was an opportunity you know i when i talked to other breweries and stuff who were in the funk zone and we were just talking about you know potential leases and things like that they were shocked to find out that you know state street you know um you know, wasn't as, you know, expensive as the funk zone and everything kind of flipped. And so we wanted a fairly big tap room uh, because we wanted to have a kitchen. We want to have a lot of space, but we also, you know, our spots, 5,000 square feet, you know, so that could be pretty pricey just for, you know, a, a monthly lease set up. And we were able to find something that worked. And, um, you know, I thought we kind of had maybe not seen like rock bottom for state shoot, I guess, but we kind of thought that the potential was there to really, um, see a rejuvenation. We didn't know exactly what it would look like, but we were kind of betting on, you know, other businesses to kind of have a similar mindset as us is that, you know, we can kind of transform this thing. Um, we're not too far away from, from something like that happening. Um, but you, you hear the horror found stories. A, you of, found a great, great building too. I mean, that's just a very yeah, well-known great building. Great. Pierre Lafon was there forever. You have nice, huge windows. Um, so it's, right. it's a great spot. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, that's, you know, one of the key things is we kind of fell in love with that building and 
we had a vision for it to have the big, you know, glass windows open up and that building's got some really cool architecture and some really cool history. Um, so, I mean, that definitely, you know, played a big factor in us kind of being able to see ourselves there. And I've always heard that you have interest or maybe some project underway of moving into the, expanding into the little place, the little alley in between. Oh yeah. Building and the other building. Yep. Um, so that's like fully happening and under construction. Um, so right next to us, you know, there's the walkway that goes to that back parking lot. And then there, what was the, the rug shop um, that was there. And I think before that it was a florist and newspaper stand and a handful of other things. But um, yeah, um, we got in touch with the landlord who had that spot and um, you know, the, the, the tenant who was there was moving out and we saw um, this great opportunity to have a lot of outdoor seating on state street, because that's kind of one of the things that uh, we thought was lacking just, you know, of course, Santa Barbara, the, the beautiful weather, the, the summer tourists, you know, it's, you know, just oozing for outdoor seating, but a lot of State Street is just a couple, three or four seats, you know, in front of the building type thing. So um, we talked with the city and we're, we were able to set up a, an agreement where we'd be able to use that for kind of like a big outdoor beer garden um, and still utilize our kitchen at our, our current spot, utilize the bathrooms at our current spot, that whole thing. Um, so we got that all worked out. Unfortunately, like COVID hit like the day we were supposed to get all the permitting pushed through and, you know, start everything. So that was on hold for the longest time. But um, as soon as everybody at the city, you know, was back in the office and, and working, we got the permits finalized on that. And uh, we're under, we've been under construction for probably the last three or four months. And we probably have another three or four months to go, I would think so. Mm -hmm. Great. And I mean, while we were talking to you, to tell us about, you know, COVID hits um, and what, like I said, I was down there one of the first nights at State Street was kind of back open and you guys had it all dialed in, it seemed like. So what was your, what was your planning leading up to, I mean, was there much planning or was it just like, <laughs> what are we going to do? And then you pull the trigger when it happened. Right. Um, well, when, when everything first got shut down, um, you know, the Santa Barbara tap room completely closed. Um, and we just tried to figure out what we we're going to do kind of at home base in Camarillo. Um, because with all the on-premise businesses shutting down, you had this big spike in people buying beer and wine at uh, liquor stores and, you know, grocery stores and things like that. So we, we had to keep production going in Camarillo because even though there wasn't going to be a need for it at either of our tap rooms, you know, there was, you know, our distributors and, you know, retail partners were, were asking for more beer than ever. So we kind of had to pivot our model there of instead of just kegging off beers like we normally do for our draft system you know we had to source a bunch of cans and start trying to you know fire that canning machine on as fast as we can to get packaged beer out the door um and then it was just kind of a waiting game for the tasting room side to see when we can kind of open up and um you know do it safely and make sure that you know santa barbara on the city level kind of had a plan for everybody um and camry had opened up a little bit earlier so we kind of had learn kind of what to do and what not to do at our Camarillo tap room. Um, and then, you know, we were, we, since we were stayed open in Camarillo with the production, we were also um, doing delivery. So we would deliver beer and pizza to anybody in Ventura County. We, we delivered beer in Santa Barbara County. Um, we were doing kind of just anything we could to, to keep our employees working. Um, and we kind of figured kind of, I guess, a decent way to do that in Camarillo. And so as soon as Santa Barbara got the green light, we kind of you know, set it all up. And then of course the changes kind of still haven't really stopped. There's, you know, been up and down since they opened it up. But I think as, as Doug mentioned, the state street being closed to through traffic and the outdoor seating. I mean, that was, I think for us, especially, but I think for probably most of the restaurants out there, that was kind of the only thing kind of keeping it, you know, open and even worth trying to be open because without those seats, it's just, kind of doesn't pencil to, you know, have three or four tables inside, you know, and still run a full restaurant, you know. All right. How's business been going, you know, since you made those moves, other than the constant, and I know this from everyone, there's a constant evolution of, of what you're doing uh, as the state and the county and the city change things here and there and tweak advice and suggestions, but what, how has business been going? It's been, I mean, look, your place looks busy from the outside. Yeah, so. yeah, we, we can't complain. Um, we're really fortunate, like I said, with the production model too so even though you know tap room sales are down we're still able to you know keep selling beer through other channels so that's you know 
a, a, a great thing that most restaurants don't have the ability to do. Um, and then I think sales in Santa Barbara are down just because we're kind of in that heart of lower state where there's a lot of new breweries and a lot of cocktail bars and stuff. And it's just, you know, usually a, not like a beer crawl type vibe, but there's a lot of people who go to, you know, State Street and the Funk Zone and they want to go to two or three places that they have on their checklist and with uh, some of the requirements and the limited amount of seating and wait times and, you know, food requirements and things like that. It just seems like it's harder to get those people to go to two or three different spots. You know, they kind of find a spot and they're going to be there probably for the majority of their night, just because it's honestly kind of a hassle to have to deal with, you know, COVID and all the different stuff that people are acquiring and the food requirement and everything. And we totally get that that stuff has to be there to keep people safe. Um, and we're fortunate to, you know, still be able to open. So even though it's not, you know, as busy as it might have been otherwise, it's still nice just to keep our employees going and, you know, have customers in the door, keeping the lights on and everything like that. All right. Great. Uh, Doug, how did you guys respond? I mean, um, both of you guys were lucky in the sense that you also serve food as part of your business model. So you didn't have to like start bringing in food trucks and, and do that right. whole scramble. Um, right. But you didn't have the benefit of a street being shut down, Doug. I mean, you don't have as much you know traffic as State Street necessarily, but what did, how did you respond and how did you expand seating to keep business flowing without, you know, taking over a street? Yeah, our, our, our story is very similar. Uh, we, we had a, we did a lot more direct to consumer curbside pickup. We also offered free delivery. Um, we, we had already, uh, before COVID had decided to up our online presence and still try and introduce our wines to more people through internet uh, advertising, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. So we'd already signed up an agency to do that. And, and luckily we were, we were ahead of the game because a lot of people went that direction to try and get, get the wine to the consumer. Um, you know, we have, we had, a, we had a fair amount of seating outside. Uh, so that, that worked out okay. And we were able to expand quite easily out, out onto the sidewalk. Uh, we couldn't handle, handle more tables at this point. We've got a lot of, a lot of tables outside. Uh, for the size of our size of our kitchen, um, but you know we're we're very jealous of the beer guys. Uh, we have a brewery right next door to us at, up in Buellton, and the owner always walks by and, and says, "Hey Doug, how long did it take you to make a bottle of wine again?" And I'm like, "Oh, geez, you know, six months to three years. You know, our top wines are in barrel for two years, and we wait a year to release them." And he goes, "You know how long it takes me to make a bottle of beer?" And we get to produce it all year round. We have to wait for the grapes to ripen in that one day. And this year it all happened at once. So you beer guys who got it easy, you know, <laughs> you can change your production pretty quickly. Uh, but, uh, but, but, you know, people were drinking wine and obviously our, uh, we, had, we're, we were mostly a direct to consumer and um, a restaurant wine. Uh, we have a, we have a, you know, our, our core wines are priced at a price that makes them be able to be poured by the glass in a lot of our local restaurants. And that business just completely stopped. It went to zero. And it was shocking to, to see that. And uh, I'm sure Sean did the same thing. You know, March, March 14th, I was going to have the best year I ever had in my entire life. And March 16th, I was figuring out how long I had to survive. You know, we were doing the, doing the, the, the burn rate, you know, what do we, what, what do we, what can we, what can we do? How long are we going to live? Um, but, you know, uh, things came back. People, people did support us. I, I really felt that. I don't know if you felt that, Sean, but we really felt that our customers, you know, wanted to, wanted to support us and, and locals wanted to support local wine. Uh, and, you know, we tried to, we priced wines to help our restaurant clients. Uh, to give them special deals on wine to help them make more money on, on some of the wines. We take a little, take a little shave and 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 help them out. Um, so we, you know, we we tried to do as much stuff as we we could, and and we, we were able to bring almost every single employee back uh, uh, into the fold and and to work. Uh, and obviously, production had to had to keep going. You know, you gotta you gotta keep making it. You can't just stop and let everyone go from either a brewery or a winery. So, um, you know, I think, I think Santa Barbara is a wonderful community. It's supportive of us. I, mean, I think you feel the same way, Sean. And uh, 
if we if we really upped our online game, which really was a big big difference for us, and in the, in the, that's where we made up our our shortfall from the distributor sales. Have you uh, been able to let people? I know some restaurants are allowed twenty five percent capacity inside. Does that apply to you guys too? And if so, have you been doing it, Doug? Yep. As the day they let us be twenty five percent inside, we we we. We did 25% on inside. The outside doesn't require food. We can still be a tasting room outside, uh, but inside, if you come inside, you have to order entrees uh, to to be able to sit inside. Um, but we don't we don't make the we don't enforce the food rule outside. Uh, you know, sometimes on a Saturday when we have a half an hour wait, uh, we'll start enforcing the food rule because we have such a long line. It sort of cuts some people out to not want to just come and do share a $15 tasting, you know, and take a right. table for three hours. For two hours. Uh, <laughs> right. We explained it. I tell, I tell my staff, just explain to them, you know, we want to, we want to maximize our revenues, especially this time of, of COVID and, you know, two people with three kids splitting a tasting is it's just not going to, not going to work. Uh, it's just, it's just a reality issue. So. Right. Sean, have you started letting people inside? Yeah, yeah, same thing. As soon as um, the 25% got passed, you know, they update it every Tuesday and we kind of keep our eye on it. And um, San Luis Obispo County, I think was a week or two before Santa Barbara. So we kind of seen it coming and talked to some of the places up there on how they did it. So we were just ready to roll. Um, and yeah, with our spot, we just kind of open the big glass sliding uh, doors in front. We have a big roll up in the back and air kind of just flies through there with a little wind tunnel, which is great. And yeah, we fit about, you know, another 30 or, or 40 people in there. Um, yeah, as soon as we could, which has been great because, uh, we've always had kind of a, like a sports bar feel as well, just with, you know, NBA finals or, you know, Dodger games or whatever. Um, before COVID, a lot of our customers would pop in after work or after dinner and, you know, just grab a beer and watch the game. And, you know, the patio is nice, but we are missing definitely a few of our regular customers who'd like to, you know, catch games and stuff. So as soon as we were able to do that, that helped a bit. And, and people are, are cool with it. Or is anyone hesitant about going inside or everyone seems cool? Um, everybody seems pretty cool. We give people the option. We still have more outside seating than indoor. So when you kind of check in with the host, they give you the big COVID spiel of, you know, all our house rules and how we're handling everything and make sure there's no one, you know, surprised by the fact that we are making them order food or they're not going to be able to get up without their mask and, you know, all the requirements. And when we give them that rundown, we usually always have outdoor seating. So, you know, we let them know we have seating outside and if we still have seating inside, which fills up a little quicker, you know, we let them go in there if they prefer that. Yeah. And Sean, your space is like our space. It's very open. It's, we have two right. doors open and there's a lot of air movement and, People feel very comfortable. I mean, I think there's certain places where you go in and it's 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 there's that one front door. There's no cross ventilation. I think that's I think that's where people get worried. But most of the, a lot of the comments we get online, you know, in in in, in press uh, is about. I mean, we actually take people's temperature uh, before we let them inside. Customers and, and employees alike, and we're really strict about. Uh, you know, we have we have alcohol at the winery, luckily, so we have all these spray bottles of alcohol, and we 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 really we really maybe go overboard, but I'd rather have people feel safe, and 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 if they if they don't want to abide by those rules, I would actually rather have them leave, because we have our employees, we have ourselves, and I don't I don't I don't I want to have it to be a safe environment for everybody, and if anyone doesn't want to abide by those rules, I'd rather have them not come in. Have either of you had those kinds of customers? I've heard some horror stories around, but have you guys had some some problem customers? Yeah, I've uh, had a, guy, a couple of guys you don't want to wear masks, you know, inside walking to the bathroom. And we're like, nope, you, you got to do it. And uh, luckily, with we're part of the Hotel Californian, uh, and if we if we have a, we have a great security team down there that that sort of takes that whole area. So we take the security off off our hands, and we just call them. And if we have a problem with anybody. We haven't had a really problem with the customer except for not wanting to put on the mask. Uh, but we have had some problems with people entering the space without getting their temperature taken or trying to use our bathrooms or sort of forcing their ways in. And, and we had one guy sort of grabbing the money out of the tip jar. And uh, we've, had, we've had a couple little security issues, but uh, 
you know, we have not nothing serious, Sean. Yeah, we haven't had anything um, too serious where we've had to call the police department or anything like that. But I mean, we're in the alcohol business and, you know, before COVID we're open till midnight on lower state streets, you know, so we're used to, you know, occasional customers who, you know, are problems. So, you know, our staff and our door people are kind of always prepared for that. Um, but it was mostly um, at the start, you know, you had LA who was a uh, county, which was and still is on a much stricter lockdown. And um, I think we saw a lot of people from Ventura County and LA County coming up to, to Santa Barbara for a few weeks at the beginning there. And you can kind of tell they were the ones who, you know, they, they weren't going up there to social distance. They were going up there because they wanted to party and they couldn't party in LA or Ventura. And, you know, they kind of had this customer is right mentality. And it's like, well, that, that might be true, except for when it comes to like public safety, you know, that's so, um, you know, we, we've had to tell plenty of people that they, they can't come in because they're not following the rules or we have to kick them out. But it was really mostly at the beginning. I mean, now, you know, I would say 99% of the customers come up and they already have their mask on. They already know the drill They're You know, it's every restaurant and pretty much any other industry is doing it, which is nice. It was difficult when it was so new to people, you'd have people who didn't have their mask or didn't care about it or, you know, whatever, but, um, yeah, it's well, it's a hundred be, times better than it started. It's going to be interesting now that it's getting colder and darker. Uh, and I, I, I'm hoping, and they'll let us do a little bit more inside uh, once we reach the next tier. Um, but, you know, uh, it, it's so funny because we'll sometimes, people will come in, it'll be 68 degrees out, and I'll go out and say, oh, do you want me to turn the heater on? And they'll say, this is like perfect. <laughs> This is so great. And it turns out they're from Minnesota and right. it, it couldn't be better. And then the other people will be 70 degrees and they'll ask us to turn on the heaters. Uh, we, uh, they're from Santa Barbara. Like if it gets below 72, it's a summer situation. So uh, I bought my heaters in August because I bought my umbrellas too late. And I, I, I couldn't, you could not get umbrellas in, in the United States of America at the, the middle of summer. Uh, and then, so I bought my heaters right away. So we're well, we're well heated right now, but, uh, it's going to get colder and it's going to get wetter and that's going to, that's going to really impact our, our situation. And we, you know, I think the same thing for you, Sean, you, we, we, we had a lot of groups, we had a lot of tastings where people would come in and do a, you know, food, wine pairing, or, or we do a master class or do some other things that were that were, you know, highly revenue generating and really good for our brand and people to, you know, really learn about the wines and, uh, and those we just haven't been able to do yet. We're excited. You know, we're doing a supper series. We're excited to start doing that again. So. Yeah. Yeah. Sean, are you, are you guys weatherizing, you know, with the weather and the darkness, are you guys doing anything to your outdoor space to make it warmer or brighter or anything? Not much. We, um, we did, um, put up lighting for all that extended patio we have in the front. We actually are able to use um, part of the parking lot behind our spot as well as overflow, um, which is lit. Um, yeah, the heater situation is one of those things where, you know, we're trying to figure that out. We've got a bunch of heaters for our future beer garden that was going to be opening next door. So we'll maybe just, you know, use those at our current spot for a while. Um, but, you know, of course, we're fortunate being in Santa Barbara versus, you know, almost anywhere else in the country that's, you know, then those people are already getting snowstorms and they have, you know, entire months where if it's only outside, they've, they've got nothing with us. You know, we might have a few slow weeks or maybe not be open a certain day if we know it's just going to rain all day and we can only fit a few people inside. But, um, you know, uh, we'll, we'll see. I, I know that the next step is 50% uh, capacity inside. We're not there yet, but if, you know, numbers get better than you know, that'd be helpful for us because our space does have good airflow, um, more so than even some of the outside pop-up stuff that you see around. I know in, in Camarillo, there's like a few outdoor seating chain places like Denny's and stuff, but it's, you know, closed on four sides with no windows, but it's technically outside. So that's the, you know, but uh, yeah, I think we're just going to kind of play it by ear. And thankfully with us, we have a pretty big spot. So um, if, if we do the 25% inside even and a few people outside, it should work pretty good. And, and this is for either of you, whoever wants to answer it. I mean, when you're looking into the future, past the winter, 
Are you guys looking at date like dates where things will start to go back to normal, or are you just um, fully embracing that this is going to be the reality for a while? And and how can we do it safely and and in a way that's still attractive? Have you have you stopped predicting the future? Uh, I you know it's I think we all ask that question of each other like what's your what's your date? You know what do you when do you think it's going to be? Um, you know, we we have a, a lot of event venues. We have the, our barrel room, and we have our vineyard. We have the mezzanine at the tasting room, and people are trying to book events. And so we're really not taking anything until uh, after after June of 2021. I I just we're penciling them in, but we're not guarantee we're not saying we're going to do it. And then because I I just can't see how we can get a vaccine and get a, our herd immunity or get it all taken care of in a time frame that is less than six months. Um, so I, I'm suspecting we're gonna operate this way until the, until the, the June, June 1st is my guess. That's sort of what we're, what, we're, what we're planning. I had said the begin, opening day of baseball 2021, but that was a couple of months ago now. And I'm not <laughs> quite as confident, but Sean, what are you guys thinking? Yeah, we're, I mean, we're, same thing. We're not really booking anything uh, event-wise. Um, our spot in Camarillo is next to a big wedding venue, so we always get a bunch of people planning on on doing stuff, and that's shut down. And then we did luck out with the beer garden because, you know, we, we started that and got those wheels in motion before COVID was a thing, and it's just, you know, it's another 5,000 square feet of outdoor seating. So, you know, that's going to work out just by luck pretty perfectly that hopefully um, – you know, after the holidays here and we kind of turn the calendar over, we should have a, a big new outdoor spot, which should be able to, you know, be COVID safe. And as, assuming the weather is all good, then then that should help. Um, and then and is that the production, open top as well, or is there a way to, yeah, to put a roof? Yeah, on it's all, it's just an open top beer garden with, um, we have that, that, I guess, like shack that was there, we're renovating and we're going to have a draft system in there. And um, but for the most part, it's just going to be all open seating in the front, kind of more casual with, you know, like a lawn setting and um, fire pit type stuff, and then a bunch of bicycle parking in the back. Um, so, you know, that'll be super COVID friendly, which will be nice. And then, um, yeah, we're production wise, we're kind of planning on things to be like this for a while. So, you know, less beer and kegs, and we're still planning on ordering more aluminum cans and you know kind of all the logistical production side of stuff assuming that you know it's going to be more off-premise sales than on-premise sales at least you know for another six to nine months and then even if it does open back up I think it's you know it's not going to be an overnight thing it's going to take a few years for everyone to kind of go back to how things were pre-COVID. Yeah yeah I heard the aluminum can market was a bit rough there for a while. Yeah, yeah, uh, it. Uh, <laughs> we, we do, we do, we do uh, our rosé in cans, and you know we're not a big customer, so we had a really hard time sourcing sourcing cans for our for our rosé, and. Uh, yeah, it's and we still haven't sourced them for the twenty vintage yet. So. Yeah, it was a a perfect storm for the aluminum business um, because hard seltzers took off and is this huge market segment that's all cans, and then craft brewers in a span of two or three years switched from entirely bottling all their product to canning all their product. And then COVID hit and everyone said, we don't need beer on taps because bars are closed, get it all to stores and cans. And so, you know, they're at max capacity at the can manufacturer's sites and they just, they just can't keep up until they get another facility online. So it's going to be hard to get cans for a while. Yeah, and I, I, I saw a, a Q and A question. Someone was asking us about whether what our what our mix was, whether we were more local or more tourist, or if the demographic has has changed. Um, I I really haven't noticed a, a big demographic change in our customers. Obviously, a lot of our customers are uh, from out of town. I think I think what I've seen and uh, is we have a lot more Southern California customers. A lot of people driving up from Ventura and Oxnard and Orange County. A lot of people jumping on the train and coming up for just the weekend. Uh, you know, we we have a lot of local customers because we have our wine club customers get a lot of benefits uh, from coming into the tasting room uh, if they join our wine club. So we have a lot of local people. I think the local people are surprised because they come in on a Saturday and there's a 20 minute wait 
and they do not like that. Uh, <laughs> you're a member of the wine club, you want to get a table, right, when you walk in. And so we're trying to encourage our local customers to come, you know, Monday through through Thursday and then and then let the people who are filling up the hotels and coming up for the weekend have, have the weekend. Uh, but it's very weather driven for us too. If it's a beautiful day, uh, a lot of people go to the beach. Then when they close the beach, they all went to our tasting room. I'm sure they went to Sean's place. Uh, it's, it's just been very odd to see the waves of what of what's happening, but uh, it's it's sort of anecdotal, but the mix has been a lot of people from Southern California. We're not seeing a lot of people from, obviously not from Europe, not from Japan. We're not seeing any Chinese tourists. We're not seeing any people from the Midwest or the even, we're seeing a few East Coasters, um, but for the most part, it's been local, which is kind of cool. I'm all, I'm all for it. Totally. Yeah, we, we've noticed the same thing and I think that's going to be the trend for, you know, next summer too. I don't know if anyone's confident enough to book that like two or three week, you know, vacation out of the country or out of the state, but people obviously still want to get away and enjoy themselves. So all the Southern California and Northern California residents are going to do these little weekend trips to cool, you know, cities like Santa Barbara that have good downtowns and lots of stuff to do. So I think that'll just continue even after COVID gets lifted um, a bit. I think it's just going to be a thing for next summer. Oh, my last question for both of you is, uh, what have you learned in responding to COVID that you think um, you're, you're going to keep going forward? Something, something that made you change the way you do your business, but it's a positive into the, fu into the foreseeable future. You know, what, what is, what's a good, what's a positive from this whole thing for, for your business um, survival and success? Um, <laughs> yeah, um, you know, for us, the silver lining was the, the canned beer. Um, we had always been, you know, 75 to 85% draft, um, maybe even more, um, from our tasting room and what we also sent to our, um, food or distributor, um, Pacific beverage. Um, and this whole COVID thing forced us to really max out our canning line and, you know, kind of focus on that, which we kind of didn't really need to before. Um, we were kind of just filling our tanks kind of how we had planned, but, uh, but now it's kind of opened up, you know, um, the option to do that. So I think moving forward, um, you know, we put a lot of focus on retail stores like Trader Joe's and Whole Foods and, you know, the grocery chains, which we never had focused on before, but because we had nothing else to do, we focused on that and we, we got some good, um, uh, leeway into those spots. And even if things kind of revert back to the restaurant business, we'll be able to at least, you know, keep production up and keep those chain stores going too, which will just kind of help our, our brew team stay busy, even if things kind of go up and down for a while. Yeah. And it, interestingly, you know, out of, uh, this is, it's not been that I had, I was a victim of the, of the Montecito flood and, and I really loved how our, our community came together and, bonded and, and, and got tighter and, and knew each other more. We know all of our neighbors on our street now, which we didn't, uh, amazingly enough. And the same thing happened with this. We feel a much tighter and closer relationship with our, with our restaurant customer and our retailers and our, and our wine club customers. I think we just got to know uh, uh, people better. We were able to spend more time uh, with, our, with our local local restaurants, local retailers, and and you know we're all in it together, and I think there's that when you have these kind of things that happen, that camaraderie is sort of a a, a joyful thing. Uh, you know, you're all fighting and, and wanting to survive, and uh, and trying to help each other out, and that's that's what we did. You know, we I still deliver once a week a mixed case of wine to Butterfly Lane on my way home because there's a couple there that has pre-existing conditions and they will not come out of their house. And they're always like, oh, that's so nice. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wave to them as they come to their door. And, you know, those kind of relationships are really meaningful to me. And, and uh, we've, that's just one incident of many, many, many incidents that, uh, uh, that, is, that is, have happened in meeting, in meeting and knowing our customers better. I think that's, that would be my silver lining. That's beautiful. We do have one other question, man. I just want to share. Yeah, I saw it. I saw that. I'm wondering, we kind of answered it already, but the, the question is, did you add any new technology due to COVID, online sales versus on-premise, time service or other time experience? So I don't, you guys have any timed experiences and then any 
technology advancements? I mean, I think we talked about online sales versus on-premise. I, I completely revamped our entire, uh, we, got, we bought distributor software to help us manage our distributor network. We got, uh, we, we tied in our point of sale system to our QuickBooks, to our distributor, so we could have real-time inventory. Uh, we, we went to a, a, a new social media uh, Slack to, to communicate better as, as, as people. We just, we felt that it was a good time to take on some really, uh, some projects that we didn't have time to do before. We were always too busy. And we, so we, we, we did a lot of, of, of technologically uh, advanced uh, work in our, in our company to be, so now we have actually, I can look at my iPhone and I can tell you how many bottles of wine I have at the warehouse, at our fulfillment center, at the tasting room, and at the winery, uh, which is quite amazing. And uh, it's it's been a big it's been a game changer in our in our ability to know where where things are and what we have, and we, were, we never knew what we had ever. <laughs> and you're not, but you're not timing people's experience. So the other part of the question, you're not timing experiences. People, I mean, you, it sounds like you are encouraging them to either eat or move on depending on the situation, but you don't have like a slot, an hour slot for tasting or anything. Oh, no. Oh, I'm sorry. I, mean, I, mean, I thought you were saying no. we were embracing technology. No, it was, know. it was two, it was two questions in one. Yeah. And that was a great I, I question mean, and it, answer. It, it, it's really hard. You know, you, Sean knows this too. When I had the restaurant, you have a restaurant, you have the best table in the restaurant. You can get a couple to come in and split a salad and get two iced teas. You can't really vet them before they said it's your best table. <laughs> Whereas if someone else could come in and order a $600 bottle of wine and two entrees, two appetizers, and even get bottled water, imagine that. Uh, so it's a tough one. You wanna, I, I mean, if I could discriminate and, and bet every customer, well, if you want to come in here, how much are you gonna spend? <laughs> you, you can't do that quite obviously. We do not limit it though. If someone comes in, as I always say, I, they're coming into my house. I, I welcome them as I would welcome them to my home. They sit down, we take care of them. If they uh, spend, they split a tasting and their, and their three kids destroy the, 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 the area with their various stuff, we thank them as they leave and, uh, and clean it all up. Um, there's just no other way to do it. I wish, you know, airlines can change pricing for different people, and, but we, 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 we just don't do it. We, we treat everyone exactly the same. Uh, and Sean, there's another good question, but uh, Sean, did you want to address any of that, either new technology or um, timed experiences? Sure, yeah, with, with technology, with similar to Doug, we synced up our online uh, beer sale platform to our POS, and we were able to push a lot more to go and pick up sales, um, you know, just from people ordering through Instagram or online site. Um, we had to get technology to route all our drivers because you know we were a pizza place and pizza is great for delivery we had never delivered before and all of a sudden overnight we were had you know 10 or 15 delivery drivers delivering pizza and beer so we had to you know get a platform for that and find a way to get everybody on the route with ways to text customers when we're going to be there and all that um so so we set up the technology side which is great because you know we still use it now even if we're not using it as much it's already set up in there for us um, and then Ventura County had a 90 minute limit, um, for all restaurants for a really long time. Um, and so when we opened, we tried to keep the policies the same. We have a lot of customers who go to both spots or especially if they live in Ventura, they're at one or the other. So when we first opened, we tried to do the 90 minute in Santa Barbara and in Ventura County. Um, but it was kind of a, a customer service nightmare because we were one of the only places doing that. Um, and of course it wasn't required in Santa Barbara. So, um, we kind of just let our employees decide on that whenever they were comfortable kind of letting that up. Then we stopped, which was maybe about a month or two ago. They said, Hey, the 90 minute, we got plenty of seating now with the extended patios and, you know, we don't need the 90 minute rule. People know that they can't just come here and, you know, hammer down and treat it like, you know, pre COVID where it's like a big party. So as soon as they felt comfortable with the customers, um, you know, we, we relaxed that rule. Right. Uh, and then another uh, good question from the audience is, have you participated in any virtual beer or wine events? If so, what was the strategy behind participating and, and did you see any benefits? I know Doug has, because I've had him on some of the ones I do. And yeah. he's got one this afternoon, I think, too. I've got one in, in an hour. Uh, we, um, we wanted to, as part of our online marketing efforts, we started in January, 
uh, we started doing these bundles of samplers that you could buy a sampler at a pretty reduced price uh, and you could get three different wines and then, then check in with us on a live Facebook or Instagram uh, tasting where I'd go through the tasting, take questions like we are right now on the, on the, on the Zoom and, and taste the wines with, with the customers and have it be very interactive and they'd learn a lot about the wines. Uh, they, people quickly figured out they could buy six bundles <laughs> so they were, they were good. we were getting these crazy orders of the sampler that we were discounting very heavily just to get them to introduce to the wine <laughs> buying a whole bunch of them so uh, you know what can you do uh but uh yeah we we've we've continued to do uh live tastings uh and uh, i think we'll continue to do them because we can record them and keep them on our website and people can check into them we actually get more uh views of post live than we do live uh, with people looking in and wanting to, you know, see, go through the virtual tasting with them. And I also, we just partnered with uh, Gelson's. Uh, we did a live tasting with Gelson's. They had, they promoted at all their 28 stores in Southern California. I got on and did two wines uh, and we paired it with some cheeses that their, and their cheesemonger got on as well. And we had over 200 people on, on that Zoom and it was very successful and Gelson's was super happy. People tasted the wine, understood them, matched them with the cheese. And the next day, uh, the Gelson's guys said that their, all their shelves of margarine wines were empty. And people came in, they also gave them a, a good price to come back and buy some more. Uh, but they, they were thrilled, absolutely thrilled on the, on the response to it. So yeah, we're doing it, we'll continue to do it. Uh, it's an educational thing and, and our customers seem to really, really enjoy it. John, have you guys tried any of the online um, virtual beer tasting stuff? Yeah, um, with us, the most common one is for, for beer festivals because, you know, they're huge fundraisers usually in the summer for a bunch of nonprofits and they all got shut down. So um, a lot of them were quick to set up virtual beer tastings where, you know, from the, you know, 30 or 40 participating breweries, they'll send you a mixed six pack of a few of the beers and everybody hops on the Zoom call, talks about their beer. So those have been really fun and great to still help out um, the nonprofits because for a lot of them, those beer festivals are kind of their main fundraising effort every year that got shut down. Um, and then we've done a lot of work with homebrew clubs too. Um, a lot of local homebrew clubs, you know, once a month, they like to go to another new brewery and check out the brew system and ask questions with the brewmaster and geek out about all the kind of nerdy beer stuff. Um, so with a lot of the local homebrew clubs, we've done like preset mixed uh, six packs or four packs that they can buy ahead of time and give them a, a week or two to swing by and pick those up and get them delivered. And then we do a, you know, chat with the brewmaster type of zoom call where they get to ask all their questions and we get to walk through the beers and, you know, taste them and score them and judge them and stuff. So we've been doing a few of those, which have been really fun too. And honestly, almost easier for us, you know, we don't have to, you know, go drink somewhere and drive home. We don't have to, you know, go to two or three different cities a week to deal with it. You know, you just give them the link and, you know, it's really easy to communicate. And in, in some ways it's, it's better than doing them in person. All right. And we got another audience question. I, I've done a few of these and I don't remember ever getting as many good questions. So oh, this, is, great this is good. Participation. This is great. <laughs> um, have, and this is one I'm glad someone else asked. Have you increased your prices due to an increase in expenses now and anticipate any more increases for 2021? Don? <laughs> uh, we have not. Um, I have thought about it because there's a lot of, well, A, there's less customers and there's a lot of COVID-related expenses when you're talking about all the, the PPE and we just need more employees in general because we have a host position who gives the rules. We maybe have an extra door person on a busy night because, you know, we want to make sure everyone's feeling extra secure, you know, and then, um, yeah, from the, from the top down, uh, prices have increased, you know, food costs and, you know, whether it's cheese or, you know, whatever, everything's getting more expensive with beer. The big thing is CO2 is crazy expensive right now. And we use a ton of that. Um, but, um, I think, we've decided at least for now to kind of just, you know, stick with our prices and kind of ride it out and kind of see where COVID takes us. But if it is obviously not sustainable to do so at some point, we might have to just because, um, you know, they are significant price increases, but um, yeah, for now we're kind of just staying pat and just kind of, 
you know, not giving any of our customers a reason not to come in because we need as many customers as we can right now. Yeah, I'm sort of in the same boat. I think if anything, uh, I maybe have decreased my prices just because we've been offering a lot of specials uh, for our direct to consumer sales and also for some of our restaurant customers. We've really made some, we made some, a whole bunch of exceptions on pricing. Uh, we used to have a three case price to get the by the glass price, and now we have it a one case so that they they don't have to expend as much money. We really we really feel like we're in a partnership with with these guys. Uh, same thing with Sean. My costs have gone up. Uh, she's the food food costs have gone up. The we use CO two as well. It's gone up. Uh, we have to have more people. Uh, the, just the just the cleaning aspect of it. We you know we we have people come in twice a week and tear the entire taste room apart, put it back together, and clean clean the whole thing. And we used to do that once a week. Um, so, but I, I do anticipate uh, you know the. Prices are going to go up for wine. They're not to get too businessy about it, but the bulk market for wine, which was quite full, uh, which is a good indicator of where, where pricing is going to go, is now zero. All the bulk wine has been snapped up, mainly due to the catastrophe that happened up in Napa and Sonoma with the fires. Uh, there, there were rampant fires. A lot of people didn't even make wine. A lot of people couldn't make wine. A lot of vineyards and wineries were destroyed. Uh, a lot of the North Coast guys were down here buying grapes like crazy. Uh, we generally buy, we contract grapes, and then at the end, we'll take 10 to 20% of spot market grapes. There were absolutely none available this year. Uh, and so we didn't get any real deals on, on grapes uh, that we sort of anticipated that we would get because there was a kind of a glut. There is not a glut anymore. Uh, the tariffs have hit us really hard. There's no, there's no American wine glass manufacturing. Uh, and so we get our glass from China. And every time we get a glass order, we get a separate invoice for a, a check that we write uh, to the federal government uh, for the tariffs. Um, and that's been pretty, pretty staggering when you're paying 15% more for one of the most expensive things you have to use to put wine in. Uh, and so, yeah, I anticipate that we'll probably not raise our price. We'll just sort of compress our our, our discounting will probably not discount as much, and, and um, but yeah, it's 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 a reality of you know you need to stay in business, you need to pay people, and uh, but I, I, I anticipate in twenty twenty one we'll see a small price increase for our wines. Great. Well, thank you for the people watching for the great questions. Uh, yeah. they, we got some good answers out of those, and. I think we've covered uh, quite a bit in our hour of time here. Um, so thank you to Doug and to Sean and Robin. I don't know if you want to uh, preview next week or uh, yeah, say anything. Except. Thank you. This has been super interesting uh, to learn how you've been pivoting and innovating and in some cases expanding your business. So thank you for all of what you're offering. Um, thank you for the opportunity to celebrate your businesses. Um, we have another show coming up next week at, at three o'clock. Um, and it's all about how we are exploring this new visioning process for State Street. So we're gonna be interviewing Brian Cernal from Cernal uh, Collaborative. He's a local architect who's also been involved with the AIA Charette where over 200 people participated and created visions and plans for State Street. And also Rob Dayton from the city of Santa Barbara who has been very influential in this whole um, reopening State Street um, planning effort. Also want to invite visitors um, on the show here to join us for the State Street uh, Promenade that's going to be starting on November 5th. And if you would like to participate as an artist, maker, or local business, um, join us and apply online. Um, our deadline for that is coming up real soon um, this Friday. So join us for that. And we hope to see you next time. Thanks so much, gentlemen, for a great show. And it's been so wonderful to be on a fly on the wall learning all this stuff. And so cheers to you. And we'll see you soon. Cheers, Robin. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye.